Hello. Hey. How you doing? I'm good. How are you, sir? All right. You're looking well. I feel okay. <laughs> good. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show yet again. Yes. When did we do it before? I want to say it was like, uh, it might have been 2018. Uh-huh. Thereabouts. What was I promoting then? I don't know. A concert? We were just talking. <laughs> well, there you go. And, and it was really good. I, I went and took a walk yesterday and I listened back to it. Oh, great, man. And so, if any. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say, if anybody wants to listen to that first one, it's number 93. Okay. <laughs> so, Wonderful. Well, you want to get started? Well, I wanted to get started with a quote from you. This was something that you said on the last time we spoke. All right. You said, isn't our life made up of stories? Our life is one story. It's a continuous chain of events, some good, some bad, some sad. And I think that that's a good place to start because anybody who sees this documentary that you're in, which anybody can check out, it's called Stallone. Frank, that is. You are a man with a lot of stories. <laughs> that's yeah, a lot place. of tales. Yeah, a lot of stories. <laughs> No, you, you hang around long enough. There's a lot of, yeah. Well, to tell everybody out there, and I do recommend they check out the documentary. It yeah. tells a lot of the, uh, the, the avenues and streets that are a part of the destination that you've gone on. Mm -hmm. The Frank Stallone story. And there's an interesting cast of characters. They not only hear from you, but there's, gosh, where do I get started? There's Arnold Schwarzenegger. John Oates, gosh, your brother is in My there. mother, my brother, Danny Aiello, Frankie Avalon, Joe Montaigne, Geraldo Rivera, uh, uh, Duff McKagan from Guns N' Roses, Richie Sambora from Bon Jovi. Quite a few people over the years, you know, and, and most important, a lot of my original band members from uh, my first band in 1965, which is kind of fun. <laughs> It, it's a great interweaving of all these different interviews, and uh, I really enjoyed it. And I'm sure everyone out there who checks it out, they're going to enjoy it, too. How did it feel to you watching it for the first time? Interesting. I was all ready to not like it, you know, just just because, you know, I mean, this wasn't my idea to do a documentary. It was brought to me. And um, so I had my legal pad and I was going to red line this, red line that, red line. I had no idea what to expect. Okay. Because mm -hmm. <clears throat> I wasn't at any of the, um, I wasn't at any of the interviews. Okay. So I just, I gave people where to go, who to talk to, but I wasn't privy to the interview. So I didn't know what they were going to say. So I was there with my manager, Dave, and we, uh, went into the screening and this was a private screen just for us with no music too, just the thing. And I must say, I was um, really pleasantly surprised. I think uh, Derek uh, Wayne Johnson, the director did a great job. I mean, remember we did this on a shoestring budget, you know, I mean, he edited this in his bedroom. Wow. You know? So, uh, and we've won five best picture awards, you know, from different film festivals. And of course, COVID came out and that kind of put a damper on everything. And uh, I'm very proud of it. You know, it, it, it's, you know, Paul, it's the first time I've been able to tell my story. Everyone else has been telling my story except me, you know, and that's all happenstance. Oh, I heard this about this. I heard this about this, but they don't, they don't know. They weren't there. They didn't hear it from me. If you didn't hear it from me, then then it's, you know, it could be a fable, you know, who knows? Was there a particular interview? And I know this is a hard question probably, but was there one that really knocked you out? Yes. Surprisingly, my brother. Yeah. When he said, Frank is anywhere as talented as I am in what he does and then what I try to do. That was Pretty cool, man. And Arnold saying, you know, and kind of saying, well, you know, 
Frank got there on his own talent. He didn't get there on his brother's talent. He got there on his own. So those were meaning. And of course, my my late mother, that was kind of nice, you know, because she was there. I think she was there from the beginning. I think mm. most mothers are. And uh, that was kind of moving, you know, and I haven't really seen the documentary since uh, like six people have died, passed mm. away. Danny Aiello, Russ Reagan, John LaRocca, Mark Harlan, my drummer, my mother. And who else? Some, some God, I, 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 like five or six people have died. So I haven't seen it since since then and uh it's kind of interesting you know i mean um there were a few people i would love to have been in it my father not being one of them because he was kind of uh i don't know can't explain he's kind of a curmudgeon you know so he wouldn't have really fought much to the hmm. table <laughs> you know the last time you you were on you were talking about how your mother at at her age she sounded so young and mm -hmm. you're somebody that you look very young. You 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 look great. And I know Thank that you you mentioned that for a singer, and I've heard other singers say this, you have to almost train like an athlete does. Well, I do. I mean, yeah. I, I, you know, I do. I mean, I was at the gym. I'm up at like 530 in the morning and I'm at the gym doing my thing because, I mean, listen, you know, Paul, I'm going to be 71 July 30th. Okay. But I have to be like a 30-year-old on stage. And what is really weird, and it's a compliment. Listen, no one likes being 71. No one likes being 81. Everyone would like to be 39 for the rest of their life, like Jack Benny, you know, <laughs> which, which I would. I mean, that was a great time for me because I was just old enough, but not too young. And <clears throat> I am in, I mean, let's face it, I'm in show business. So I'm in competition with these youngsters, but... What has happened is I've become a bit of a mentor, you know, to the young musicians that have seen the documentary because they'll never go what I would, they'll never go through what I went through because it's just a different time. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. they, you know, when I came up, there were newspapers and radios, period. That was it. You either got a story in the newspaper or they played your song on the radio and that was it. So there was no social media. So, it was, it's a, it's a different time. So, you know, I get a lot of, well, how did you, how did you do things without cell phones? And so I said, well, you know, people did stuff for over well over 125 years without cell phones, because uh, the difference was when you said you were going to be somewhere at a certain time, you showed up, right. You didn't text and go, Hey man, I'm stuck in traffic, you know, or if you did, you pulled over and went to a phone booth and tried to call their mother at home and hopefully you know the and that's just the way things were i i, I hate to say it it's almost like they're on an honor system in a way because now it's very easy to just blow someone off you know mm. uh well whatever you know and and so i'm from a different time so when i say well you know i grew up playing 160 minutes of music at night five nights a week you know four sets on you know, 40 minutes, that's 160 minutes of music a night. So you learn your craft, eh? You learn uh, what works, what doesn't work, how to read an audience. There's some audiences that love to hear chatter, and there's some that just want to hear music. Right. And you have to know that. And then you learn things like, uh, you know, like Frank Sinatra told me, he says, <clears throat> he said, never disrespect your audience. Meaning, you know, just, you know, if you're going to go up there, do it right. Don't come up drunk. Don't come up sloppy. Don't come up looking like hell. Don't, you know, sit there, use profanity just for profanity's sake. It says, do your show and be a pro, you know, and that's always been my motto. Like, I really don't like uh, people that are late. I don't like being late. Uh, Frank Sinatra said, when you're on time, you're late. Because <laughs> he was always there. It's true. He was always there 15, 20 minutes early. <clears throat> and if you didn't show up and you were late, he would leave and you're dead then. Because he said, his theory was this, I'm Frank Sinatra and I can be on time. I can be early. What's your excuse? I'm a pretty busy guy myself. You know what I'm saying? So my brother's the same way. Very punctual. <laughs> Very punctual. Comes on the set. You better know your lines. You better know what you're being paid for. 
Okay, so th- that's a professionalism. I think that comes with when when you are a young young man and you're playing these clubs, you got to show up on time, man. You know, because you you're poor, you can't afford to lose a gig. You know, hmm. only had one guitar then. Now everyone's got like 30, 40 guitars on stage. You have one guitar. <laughs> But, you know, you bring up a good point in that a lot of times I, I get emails from people and they, they've released their first album. Mm-hmm. And it's almost like they have this feeling of, if I may say, it's almost like they feel like they don't have to do anything anymore. Oh, yeah. And so what I'd like to know from you, you're someone who you've been working in music for decades now. Mm-hmm. What do you see is the difference between... The guys that come, the guys and girls who come on the scene that make it, and the ones who don't. Uh, you know, Paul. A lot of it's luck. A lot of it's luck. A lot of it's timing. A lot of it is who's pushing you. Okay, I never really had that, and I'm not making excuses. But I never really had mentors. I didn't have anybody <clears throat> to guide me. I didn't have managers that were like, "Well, I would stake my life that they're going to do this and do that." I didn't have that. Uh, I think the biggest mistake you have a record out and you don't think you have to do anything. Well, guess what? Either is anyone else. <laughs> and uh, you can find yourself playing a uh, beef and ale bar in about a year, which I've done. I went from Dinah Shore, Midnight Special, all these major, every major TV show to the group breaking up and playing at a beef and ale jo- joint for 30 bucks a night on a, sitting on a stool on a playing acoustic guitar. So, uh, yeah, you have to learn to eat crow. You have to learn that all is possible. It's some people are very fortunate. You know, they, their careers were really handled. Well, they had, uh, all that good stuff. Um, mine was, you know, it was just hit and miss, hit and miss, hit and miss, hit and miss. Hmm. That's what it was. Well, speaking of hitting, one of the things that people get to see when they watch the Stallone documentary is I loved the clips of you boxing with Geraldo Rivera. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that was a weird uh, <clears throat> that was a weird experience. It was Again, it was something that I did not clamor to do. I just happened to be doing the Howard Stern show that day. And he had just got off the phone or he was on the phone with Geraldo and Geraldo was saying, you know, I'll fight any celebrity out there. Now, I, I had been I hadn't been in the ring in 12 years. So in those days, unfortunately, I smoked cigarettes and uh, which I would not suggest anyone do. And. And for some reason, I got coerced in the fighting Geraldo Vera, which I didn't really want to box. I really didn't, you know, but. Howard kept calling me, waking me up at God and godly hours. Hey, you're going to fight Geraldo. So my friends said, ah, why not? I said, okay, I'll fight him with no headgear and 10 ounce gloves. I figure even if you get tired, I can bang pretty good. up. hit him on the chin. It'll be all over. Well, make a long story short. First day in the gym, I get my ribs separated, which means that's like an eight month healing situation. So if someone went bing on your ribs, you drop to the ground. I said, this is great. Then I started doing road work. And so my legs felt like lead because I, you know, I just hadn't done it, you know? So I got in the best shape I could in the short amount of time and I fought him. And when I went to New York to fight him, it was really a big deal. It was the biggest show Howard Stern had ever had to that point. It was simulcast on radio and TV at the same time. Now this is before social media. This is 1990, 91, something like that. And so I fought. You know, of course, they changed the rules. I had to wear 16 ounce gloves and headgear. Uh, they had to shoot my ribs up backstage with <laughs> Novocaine. And uh, so it was a big thing, you know, but Geraldo's in my documentary. We, we became good friends. You know, listen, there was no, listen, on my end, there was no animosity at all. I had no problems with Geraldo. He was always nice to me. What do you think somebody can learn from the sport of boxing? Because some people have, you know, I I grew up seeing boxing my whole life. My dad grew up in Philadelphia and he boxed for a while. Yeah. And sometimes people have the idea, they this wrong idea that boxing is two guys beating the hell out of each other. Mm, and yeah. it's way off. Way off. Uh, boxing is a skill. It's so much harder than people think. 
that's the that's the misnomer on this thing. It's very hard. It's it's milliseconds, quarter of an inch, just the idea. You, you drop your right hand, guy comes over, bang, and counters you with the left hook. So it's it's very much a chess game. But I think the best part of it is it really gives you a discipline because when you get mad, you're going to lose because hmm. you're mad. The guys that are great are cool customers. They don't get, they don't show anything. You know, they don't, if they get hurt, they don't show they're hurt. They don't dance around and do clowny stuff. They, everyone's trying to be Muhammad Ali and that's never going to happen. There's only one Muhammad Ali and there'll always be one Muhammad Ali as there will be <clears throat> one Frank Sinatra or one, this one, that. And, but I think for me, uh, suffering from severe panic attacks and anxiety, uh, probably from my youth, I don't know. But I think for me, what, what I got out of it was, it was a great stress release. It was a great tool to be regimented. In other words, you have to go up and do road work, whether you want to or not. You get in that ring and you get tired, you can have your head handed to you. So there are things you must do. There are regimental things you must do. I mean, uh, when I had, when I bought, fought, I had to make a certain weight. And I used to sit there and I lived in a pretty bad neighborhood in Trenton, New Jersey at that time. I'm not from there, but I lived there. <clears throat> Having to get up at, I get up at four in the morning, like 4.30 in the morning. And it was cold out, man. But there was something different at that time in the morning. It's cold, but it's a different cold, you know, because the air is kind of, and I would sit there and run around this track at a, at a school that was down the street. And it was a pretty rough neighborhood, but no one was up yet then, you know. And I remember just wearing like a leather coat and I'd wear like dry cleaning those plastic bags underneath with like Vaseline and stuff <laughs> and a sweatshirt. Uh, of course, there was no Walkman back then. So there's nothing, no music to sit there and entertain yourself and like a knit hat and just like a like a like a cowboy bandana or something and run. All you could hear was <sighs> your vest. And I got to tell you, it was boring as hell. And I was never, I'd never had the greatest endurance. Some people can just run and run and run all day. Not me. Man, when I first started out to get that first quarter mile, half mile, I was, I was dying. And then you build up. And you build up to like three miles, two and a half miles, three miles. And so that was a discipline. That was something you had to force to do. And uh, and I have found fighters, I don't know so about much now. Fighters talk too much junk now. But I always found fighters to be some of, some of the, actually some of the nicest people I've ever met because they don't really have to prove how tough they are. They are tough. <laughs> you know, what, what they do for a living is tough and they are tough. And so I have great respect for them. Uh, I know they're doing this clownish stuff with celebrity boxing and all. I said, come on, man, don't, don't disgrace the sport. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, you know, and uh, so that's why that's why I found what was good about it. Now look at it. I mean, women are in the gym boxing. It's executive boxing. When I was coming up, there was no music in the gyms. There were no women allowed in the gyms and boxing gyms. No way, man. Well, because guys are walking around with no clothes on coming out of the showers. I mean, it wasn't really. <laughs> no. Yeah. Hey, man, what's happening? You got my towel? And guys, you know, just <laughs> fully exposed. So it was like a different time. Well, if you go through, if someone goes through the Frank Stallone discography, mm -hmm. you're going to have just a great variety of stuff from ballads to more rockers mm -hmm. to the albums that you did where you're singing classics, the standards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there something you did to develop your voice? Um, yes. Radio when I was growing up was very diversified. It's not like it is now. It wasn't run by clear channel. Or this is what you play. 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 I mean, when I was a kid, you'd listen to, which would be AM radio. You'd have Frank Sinatra singing strangers in the night. Then the next song would be uh, <clears throat> the Rolling Stones singing satisfaction. And then you'd have Dean Martin singing everybody in the love and spoonful. You didn't have to be so nice. So it was very, uh, a very diverse radio was very diverse and being a person who loved music. I mean, you know, I mean, I love Nat Cole, Frank Sinatra, 
Elvis, of course, the Everly Brothers. And so I liked all kinds of music. So <clears throat> so what I like, I sang. And, you know, as you as you see in the documentary with Russ Regan saying, he goes, well, maybe that's one reason Frank didn't make it as big, because he wasn't one sound and stick with one sound. And uh, maybe that is the case. But I enjoyed the hell out of doing all kinds of music. I mean, I love folk music. I mean, I toured for years as just a single playing acoustic guitar. And that def- and that will definitely separate the men from the boys real quick. <laughs> because you have no band to fall back on. Hey, all right, take it. No, you're it's you. Yeah. So <clears throat> that was, I think that that is why I liked uh, music because I was exposed to everything. You know, we're exposed to classical music. You had the NBC orchestra would do concerts, Leonard Bernstein. I mean, there was just so much music, doo wop. They were playing because. The program directors in those days ran the show. So if he wanted to play this or that, they did. They, they weren't really, um, really overridden by any big shot. And so, yes, I do have, I have three big band albums. I have, God, I have a lot of albums. I have a few albums where it's more acoustic, I guess, urban country-ish. And then I have rock albums. But but that's what I, Paul, that's why I incorporate my show. I know people think it's really bizarre. Hmm. They go, well, how do you do that? I said, well, I do. It's taken <laughs> a while, but I incorporate all my, all my styles of music in the one show because I slowly, and you're not even aware of it. You're going, wait a second, we're going from Cole Porter to staying alive to this and that. And it's just it's just the way we coordinate the show. It's taken a while to do, but it works. One of the really, really cool versions you do, uh, I think it's one of the best versions of Beyond the Sea. Oh, you, just, thanks. you yeah. nailed that. Well, he was a big influence for me because <clears throat> I think I liken myself more to Bobby Darren than Frank Sinatra because Bobby Darren, unlike Frank Sinatra, wrote songs played guitar, and he did a lot of different styles. I mean, he started with Splish Splash, Queen of the Hop, all those songs like that. Then he went to Beyond the Sea, uh, Clementine, Artificial Fly. So he, and then <clears throat> later he went into, he took his hairpiece off and started playing acoustic guitar, folk songs, wrote that song, Sing a Simple Song of Freedom. So he was a very uh, well-rounded, diversified artist. So I think I'm, I'm more like him than Sinatra. Of course, people will say Sinatra because most people don't know the difference. If it's American songbook or standards, automatically it's Frank Sinatra or Tony Bennett. But there's there's a lot of people in between. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, I remember, God rest his soul, we had Sammy Nestico as a guest. Uh, on my radio show and he makes an appearance in the documentary and I was asking him, I said, well, Sammy, what songs do you think I should play interspersed in between the interview bits? And he had a few of them, but one of them, he said, he said, you ought to play Frank Stallone like someone in love. Oh yeah. You know what? It's very, first of all, he was a wonderful, wonderful, kind person and when we did my album he said well you know man what do you want i said sammy you do whatever you want to do so he had free reign with me so when he's doing like someone in love spring is here when they're doing the pieces in roboto for the people out there that means without rhythm so the music going like this he told me that this was his favorite album he ever did because he got to do what he always wanted to do because he's known for count basie and more brass and stuff like this but he's a great string arranger awesome string well you heard on the record i mean so he loved this album because uh you know of course i was younger you know and we went up to canada and did it and uh i'm very proud of that album you know and tony bennett wrote the liner notes to it so i'm very proud of that album and and i miss sammy matter of fact i talked to him not too soon before he passed. But I got to tell you, 
with Shirley, his wife, he had a really good life. He had a great, you know, his first wife, Marge, passed. And Shirley was with him for maybe 30 years, and she was great. And he had a nice life. I mean, he lived in a nice house. He was well taken care of. And he just loved life. He was just always happy. I never saw him. I never saw him bummed out. He was always like... He was like an old bebopper, you know, hey, man, you know, like he would tell me stories about Count Basie and all that stuff in the 40s because he was a trombone player. And, and that's how he started. He started with Tommy Dorsey, then went to Count Basie. So he'd been around since the, <clears throat> the big band era. So for me doing the Standards album, this was perfect. And, you know, we're both Italian and he's just such, such a wonderful man. I mean... I don't know anyone that ever had a bad word to say about Sammy. And I'm so happy you had him on your show. I'm so happy he mentioned uh, songs from uh, In Love and Vain album. Yeah. Very sweet man. He never called them CDs. You know, he is from Pittsburgh. <laughs> oh, yeah. That album Frank has. Album. No, he's, he's not from the era of CDs. He's from the era of albums. You know, he's like album man. And he's just such a cool guy. Yeah. Well, for anybody who watches this documentary, Stallone, Frank, that is, is there something that you want them to take away from that experience of seeing it? Absolutely. Well, I want the people to take away um, the, the self-belief, belief in oneself, and not a false belief, a real belief. And when people watch the documentary, they'll know what I'm talking about. You have to have a belief in something. I mean, whatever, whether it's a higher being, whether it's yourself, but you have to. And, and that's what I had because I didn't have anything else. I really didn't have what we call growing up a big support system. I didn't have any mentors. I didn't have anything. <clears throat> but, I, but I believed this is what I was born to do. I believe this is what I was born to do. I believe God or who whatever higher, higher being that's out there had this in store for my brother and myself. Cause we didn't come from an artsy fartsy fan. My father was a hairdresser, hmm. you know? I mean, so we didn't come from like, you know, like a lot of these kids, like Carly Simon as great as she is, but not, you know, her father owned Simon and Schuster. So she was around the intellect eye, you know, that, that whole New York thing which doesn't diminish her talent at all because I think she's fantastic. But so I didn't grow up in that. You know, I grew up, my father was a, a immigrant from Italy, a uh, hardworking guy, real, real short, not too uh, generous with the compliments, you know? So uh, we kind of had to make our own, own uh, music. And what's really nice. We, I just found out uh, they're starting to play it, our film on the airlines. Oh, nice. Which is nice because that's a definite captive audience. They're not going anywhere unless they parachute <laughs> out of the plane. But I mean, uh, and so that's really nice. And, uh, you know, we've won, you know, five Best Picture Awards in the in the uh, film festival. Unfortunately, you know, we were going to have a big red carpet and all that stuff. But the COVID thing, as with anybody, screwed everything up. We were going to go to Con at meet them, but it just killed us, you know, shoot us up. And uh, and uh, so we didn't really get to hit all the film festivals because they were all just closed, you know. And uh, the one I was happy with was the Garden State Film Festival because I'm not from Jersey, but I lived there for a long time. Mm -hmm. It was just eh, nice, you know, Garden. Philadelphia gave us ungats, nothing. So we, Philadelphia doesn't show much love to the Stallones. It's very weird. The people are kind people, the people are good. But as far as the powers that be, they don't really give us that way. You know, they took the statue down off the steps, you know. Yeah. Which before that art museum, I know very, very well. You could have shot a howitzer up the stairs and not hit anybody before Rocky came out. Yeah. No one ever went there. Okay. No, seriously, you could have fragged the whole steps and wouldn't have hit anybody. So Rocky really brought the attention to that art museum. So, and, you yeah. know, but I was happy about winning the Garden State Film Festival. You know, the Beverly Hills Film Festival was nice to win because it's, you know, it's in my neighborhood. Well, I don't live in Beverly Hills, but it's down the street. But 
it's nice to be it's nice to be recognized because as we know with the political correctness and the cancel culture, everything that's going on, um, it's nice to be recognized for for for, for your work. You know, hmm. especially in Hollywood. I mean, Hollywood, the whole business has gotten so strange and so weird. I mean, I just feel like, you know, like a Martian now. <laughs> no, I, I do. It's just like, you know, it's, it's like nobody. I think we people have become so intolerant of other people. My, my theory is I always have had I have my opinions but I've always had a little bit of a live and let live type attitude. I said, that's what someone wants to do. God bless them. As long as they're not hurting anybody or right. they're bumming someone out, I, I personally don't care. But, you know, now it's like, if you don't agree with this person, you get canceled or this or that, you know, and it's just uh, kind of sad to see that people just cannot uh, tolerate someone to have another opinion other than theirs. And what it does, it makes people, you know, Paul, jaded. People have gotten very jaded. People have no sense of humor anymore. I mean, for Christ's sakes, you probably couldn't show the Jeffersons or All in the Family anymore on TV. And those are great shows. Yeah. But people are so prickly and so apt to get somebody. Mm -hmm. You know, I love all those movies. The Producers, Blazing Saddles, Young Frankenstein, you know, History of the World. But I get it. It's it's a goof. It's a comedy. I mean, but people get like, hey, man, you're re we're not representing anybody. It's a stupid comedy. Like All in the Family, to me, was one of the great shows of all time. And the thing is, Carol O'Connor himself was the biggest liberal in the world. But he played Archie Bunker, who was like so, the so-called bigot. But in his real life, but it's acting. You know, I think Lawrence Olivier said something to Dustin Hoffman <clears throat> when they were doing Marathon Man. Dustin Hoffman ran like 10 miles. He was getting himself into the character. And Sir Lawrence Olivier said, back, goes, have you ever tried acting? <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, but it is acting. Yeah, I mean, it's that that's what it is. And we just become so prickly and so out to get people, you know. And I've always been a conservative, even though I grew up in the 60s, love and peace. You know, of course, everyone was for that stuff, but I was never like, you know, I was not a flag burner. I wasn't a draft card burner. You know, I mean, the, everyone knows now you look back that the Vietnam War sucked. No one was, I got drafted. No one was saying that was good, but we, we somehow kind of coexisted without tearing other people down and just, you know, destroying people's livelihoods. It's, it's really kind of sad. Mm -hmm. But the one thing I think that brings us together is music. Music does bring us together in many, in many, many ways and many assets, uh, aspects, I think. And, uh, yeah, I'm very proud. You know what? I know it's considered in the old days, hey, it's like a song and dance, man. You know, in the old days, they say no dogs, cats, or actors. You know what I mean? When you used to go to hotels. Mm -hmm. I mean, actors were, were considered really, actors and musicians were considered really second-rate citizens, you know, around the turn of the century. You know, the guy goes, ah, hey, he's just a stage door Johnny, some song and dance man. But that's what I am, a song and dance. That's what I do. And I'm very proud of it because I think it's a noble profession. Uh, I don't think it's easy to do. If it's easy to do, everyone can get up and do it. All you have to do is just go to a bar and listen to people sing karaoke. You really know why people <laughs> can't do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I mean, so I, I think get what getting out of the film is perseverance of belief in self. I think uh, <clears throat> loyalty to friends and families, uh, sticking to your guns. I, I admit there's a few things I did in my career where I would say I maybe sold out, but not really. I didn't, I never did anything that I said, no, there's no way I'm doing that. Like I've done almost well, 78 movies, never did nude scenes, never did. Say, and they go, why? I said, cause I don't want to, because <laughs> I am 
from the era of John Wayne and Gary Cooper. And I just can't picture John Wayne with doing a nude scene or Gary Cooper. I just don't see it, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, and um, or James Cagney. Now listen, say, you know, or Everett G. Robinson. I just don't. So that was <clears throat> kind of my criteria. Yeah, Clint Eastwood. Yeah, I love Westerns and war movies and all that stuff like the best years of our lives. And I just can't picture the people that I admire doing that because they were really, and I'm not saying they were prudish. I just don't think they would do it. Right. I mean, I just don't. I mean, I don't think taking your clothes off is sexy. I think Clark Gable with Vivian Lee and Gone with the Wind is pretty sexy. I think Elizabeth Taylor making out with Montgomery Cliff and Place in the Sun is pretty sexy. And they had their clothes on. Postman Rings Twice with John Garfield and Lana Turner. So I think that's just an excuse. And they've asked me. I said, no, I don't want to do it. They go, I said, because I don't want to do it. I didn't sign up for that. <laughs> so don't pull that shit with me. I don't like, they go, well, you have, no, I don't have to do it. I said, the only thing I have to do is pay my taxes and die. And my taxes are, that's something that, well, <laughs> think about that. Now. But I mean, but you know, these girls go, well, they made me do it. I said, they didn't make you do it. You did it. They make you do it. Cause that they made you do it. They go to prison <laughs> for making you take your clothes off in a movie. Cause you agreed to do it. Right. Mm. <laughs> I've asked my brother about certain movies. I said, would you do that? He go, hell no. I said, well, have you done Brokeback Mountain that they paid you a hundred million? He goes, hell no. Why? He said, because it's just not my thing, man. <laughs> yeah. Matter of fact, I was having that conversation with him and Jimmy Kahn, James Kahn. Jimmy Kahn said, what are you, crazy? <laughs> <laughs> Brokeback Mountain? What, 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 what am I, nuts? So, I mean... And but some some people have a different perspective about acting. Some people just do anything. Right. Some people have a, a, a certain thing, a certain parameters that they will go and they will not go. And you know what? And if other people want to do that, God bless them. You know, I mean, again, that's their right to do whatever they want to do. So it's uh, again, that's my theory. And I'm a pretty conservative guy, but I'm not that conservative where I'm so you know ham-fisted on something where I just can't budge on it, you know. But I would say on a whole, I've done most things on my terms and and maybe, and uh, no, Paul, a lot of mistakes. Oh, a lot of mistakes on the road, on the on that road to uh, degradation. There were a lot of mistakes and a lot of shoulda, woulda, couldas. But but isn't that part of growing up? Isn't that part of the process of living? Oh, Are yeah. we perfect? I don't know anyone that's everything they've done is perfect. It's impossible. There was always saying uh, there's never perfect people, only perfect moments. <laughs> yeah. Which is true. You know, it's like uh, my father would say, well, you know what? If a person's words, no good, they're no good. Or, you are judged by the company you keep. I mean, when you think about it, if you just take it on a surface level and you're hanging around with these really bad people, there's something suspect about you, something a little screwy with you. And I mean, again, but people are allowed to do what they want to do, but they have to live with their own consequences. And, you know, I've had a lot of regrets, Paul, a lot of regrets, a lot of things Maybe I should have done. And I, and I think the biggest mistake I made was I was too loyal. Now, I don't mean when I say that, but I, was, I am a loyal person. But I was too loyal to people that didn't, couldn't do anything because they were friends. Where if I would have just moved on, maybe things would have been different. You know, a lot of these people that are very famous are they're pretty treacherous. Hmm. Yeah, you know, they'll they'll you're out, you know. But I was always a little, you know, sentimental, loyal to certain people that handled my career that really couldn't do the job, and that that's probably the biggest regret. I think uh, things might have gone a little different, but you know what? The most important thing is, I'll be 71 July 30th. I'm healthy. I'm never, if ever, sick. 
you know, and I, and I, and I'm, I can see, I can talk, I can run, I can walk. So I'm blessed. There's a lot of people out there that their lives are so bad and so sad. So I'm, you know, I'm batting a thousand. How many guys are 71 years old that can go on stage and play the blues and dance around and sing and laugh and, you know, have fun. Most people by 71 are like depressed. They don't, they don't want to talk to their wives anymore. It's like, yeah, Christ, I have been married to her for 50 years. You know what I mean? So I'm, I'm pretty, I'm good, man. I'm good. I'm, I mean, I'm looking forward to some other stuff. That's why I'm in the gym training hard for the 28th. I, mean, I want to be yoked by the time I hit the stage. You want people to look at you at 71 and go, God, look at him, man. Yeah. Like Tom Jones, my friend. Tom Jones is on stage, man. He's still kicking butt. You know, he doesn't let any dust grow under his feet, for sure. <laughs> well, if anybody wants to go to your website, it's yeah. frankstallone.com. Yep. They also can follow you on Twitter, at Stallone. And then the yeah. Instagram, I think it's Frank period Stallone. Yeah, Frank.Stallone. And my Facebook is at Frank Stallone. So as you notice, I do everything I can remember. So I don't, put, <laughs> I don't go fancy schmancy on that stuff. And also they can, they can watch uh, Stallone Frank, that is, on Amazon Prime. It's free. Right. And I think it's on Google Play. And I believe it's on iTunes. And I think it's on a few other ones. I just can't remember at this point. And uh, I love hearing from my fans. You know, I tried. I, I earnestly do respond to, to, to my fans because, you know what? It's like I was it's a really funny thing in closing. I was walking with my brother Saturday all through it was just a thing. We were just brother stuff walking through Beverly Hills. And of course, every 20 feet, you know, oh, people from all walks of life, you know, Rocky changed my life. Do you mind if I get a picture? Can I shake your hand? Or or people with their kids. Huh. And he does it. He says, you know what? This this is what builds careers. This is because these people to you, you might say, well, you know, I do this a hundred times, but to them, it's like really important because they've seen you on screen for 40 years and to actually have a picture with you. They'll be your fans for the rest of your life. There's nothing anyone could say to them that could bad mouse Sylvester Stallone. Right. No, no, no. He took a picture with me. He was great to me and my kids. So that's, how that's how you build fans that's how you build a legacy and there's a lot of people i will leave nameless that are in this business that are horrible to their fans they're mean they're just you know cavalier and i say because you know what they haven't suffered enough yet hmm. wait till no one gives a shit who you are then then when you were a famous guy and you're walking that street and people just walk by you don't even know who you are then you'll think about those people that just walked up to you and asked you for an autograph for their kids. It's true though. Yeah. It's really true. Well, Paul, I want to thank you for uh, having me on your show. My pleasure. And, uh, I hope we do it again. And I hope uh, so. And I'm happy you enjoyed the documentary. I enjoyed it a lot and I recommend everybody watch it. It's, it's really, it's inspiring and you are inspiring Frank Stallone. Well, I try. <laughs> I try. I'm like old man Rivers, man. I just keep on rolling. <laughs> I like that. Well, thank you, Paul. And have a have a great uh, rest of the summer. All right, sir. Until Stay next safe. time. Until next time. Be good. Bye-bye.